Hey, hey, welcome in to the Big Ten Huddle. I'm your host, JR, and we have got a lot to talk about going on in the Big Ten. It is the NCAA Tournament Preview episode, so all the teams are still in it. We'll see how long that lasts for, but we have Evan from Boiler Breakdown with us and Blake from the Scarlet Shoot Around podcast. Evan, how you doing tonight, man? Good, JR. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, glad to have you here. Blake, how you doing tonight, man? Man, how could you be anything but good? The Oscars are in the tournament for the first time in a decade. I just got to Memphis. I'm cozied up in my hotel. Life's pretty good, man. Hey, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Blake, I had my daughter uh, fill out her bracket last night, okay? And so the way we do this, she's two. The way we do this is she sees the picture of the mascot, and we say farmer versus whatever. So I said farmer versus Aggie, and she pointed to the farmer. I said, okay, <laughs> farmer versus cougar. She pointed to the farmer. Okay. And I just kept going on and on and on. She, dude, she's got Nebraska in the Elite Eight. So if my two-year-old go. daughter knows anything, uh, it, it should be uh, good news for the Cornhuskers this uh, tournament. Hey, I mean, if she needs a Scarlet Shoot-Around uh, shirt, they're the hottest thing on the market right now. So, <laughs> Yeah, you got sizes in 2T, toddler sizes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. Hey, everybody. We are going to be breaking down some uh, Big Ten preview of uh, games for you all. But before we get to that, I do want to make sure we touch on a little bit the uh, Big Ten NIT. Oh, before we do that, please do like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Uh, our podcast is brought to you by Big Banter Sports, BigBanterSports.com. Evan's podcast is also brought to you by Big Banter Sports. So go check them out, BigBanterSports.com, for all your Big Ten media needs like and subscribe we appreciate it okay like i said let's get into it the big 10 nit happened last night there are nit games going on but fortunately we uh got all the big 10 games on last night and we swept 3-0 ohio state won at home against cornell iowa won at home against kansas state and minnesota went into butler and beat them there so all of these teams are in the second round we could uh talk about the matchups coming up however we got our NCAA tournament matchups, so we're probably not going to talk about those. But, uh, guys, Evan, we'll start with you, man. Did you see any of these games? Do you have any thoughts about Ohio State, Iowa, Minnesota coming out on top? Any thoughts here, man? I was not able to, to watch any games. I was um, a little surprised Minnesota got the got the win, um, just being just from the fact that, you know, it had been interesting to see Butler if they were able to make it all the way to the finals because they're playing NIT final in Hinkle Fieldhouse. So that would have been just a cool story. But, I mean, shout out to the Gophers for uh, getting it done on the road. Yeah, yeah, huge game by them, and uh, that was, dude, that that Butler guard at the end of the game turning that ball over. If anybody mm-hmm. watched that game, I I feel so bad for that kid. He was on the free throw line just, like, head down, and, of course, you know, <laughs> lip reading. You could tell what he was saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the entire time, but, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Blake, did you catch any of the games last night, man? you have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I had the quad box up. I watched some of the first four <laughs> games. I didn't watch a ton of the NIT. I tried to tune in. I'm a big NIT proponent because that's usually where Nebraska is. So I'm pretty familiar with the event myself. Um, yeah. But, no, I mean, Ohio State, right, with the Jake Diebler um, t- pulling the interim tag, I think they made the right choice. We talked off the air. You know, if he wasn't going to stay at Ohio State, I think he would have had a multitude of options to go either high-level, mid-major, or even maybe low-level Um you know, power six. So, and, and, but this team, I mean, look at what they're doing. What, look at what they've done since he, he, you know, has, has been named the interim head coach and now the permanent head coach. I mean, they beat Purdue. Sorry, Evan. I mean, they beat That's Purdue. Not- I mean, they, they beat Nebraska. I mean, they, which yeah. maybe he's not saying a ton, but <laughs> it, it, they've been on an absolute towards reach battle went for 17. Akpara went for 16. He's not normally a good score for them. Bruce Thornton only held to uh, nine points, four assists, but Roddy Gale went off for 17. I mean, they played really great. Uh, Buckeyes obviously look like one of the hotter teams in the country right now. That's not in the NCAA tournament. Um, Iowa, you know, Nebraska played Kansas state. We took care of business down in Manhattan earlier this year, but, um, you know, a team that was just narrowly missed the, uh, the NCAA cutoff, um, as you know, I think they want to, you know, um, they had, I, they had been projected earlier to get into the tournament, but you know, mm-hmm. with the big 12, meet they weren't able to, to cross the finish line, but really nice game for, uh, Peyton Sanford obviously went for, uh, 30 points, 12 rebounds. I mean, that's just insane. The guy is an absolute monster. Kirky went for 24. So the two those two guys combined for 54 points, which is over half of what uh, Iowa had in 91. So incredible job there. But I want to give the most props to Minnesota. I mean, to walk into Butler and like Evan mentioned, you know, that Butler had aspirations of playing in their home gym and winning this NIT. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, what, 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 Ben Johnson has been able to do, given the preseason expectation, I mean, they were the floor of the Big Ten. They were not expected to do anything. Minnesota 
fans were talking about, you know, finding ways to, or at what point in the season he's going to get fired and look at what they're doing right now. It's, it's unbelievable. And you know, it all starts with, with what Elijah Hawkins is able to do 11 points, six rebounds and 15 assists. I mean, are you kidding me? The, the guy is unbelievable. He, he just, it's, it's, it's an absolute joy to watch him play. You know, Dawson Garcia went for 25 points, Payne threw in 11. Uh, Christie had 10, so they had, they had five. And then Fox had, had 10 off the bench. So uh, it's absolutely incredible what, what Minnesota has been able to do this year. And I can't give Ben Johnson enough credit now. I think he comes second to Fred Hoiberg, obviously, in Coach of the Year vote. But it, it you can't say enough to what, what's been going on in Minneapolis. Some say all of our coaches should have been co-co-co-coaches <laughs> of the year. Uh, you know, but you know, that's a, that's a conversation for another day, I suppose. Uh, no, dude, I, Blake, you're, you're right, man. I, I have given Elijah Hawkins his credit on this show multiple times this year, not just his passing ability, but man, how quick he is the way he just like glides around the court and nobody can stick with him. I mean, when you guys, when you have that guy running around screens, it's a shame. He's not as much of a catch and shoot player. If he had a little bit more height and, uh, had a little bit more shooting ability, not that he has bad shooting ability. I mean, he hit a three in this game. It's just, he was one for five. However, at the end of the day, <clears throat> that's obviously not his his biggest strong suit. His strong suit is obviously passing, which I guess, you know, he does that pretty well too, 15 assists in this game. And I think he, at one point, was the leading assist per game or the assist per game leader in the nation. But I think he lost that by 0.1 or 0.2 points or something like that. So, yeah, Minnesota, crazy, crazy cool. Parker Fox, man, the, the passion he was playing with last night, I mean, it was just like he would not be denied down low and uh i know ben johnson has been uh leaning on him quite a bit this season for that so good stuff there uh we'll go ahead and talk about purdue now uh psu underscore mish brings up a, a good transition point here he says grambling state looks really impressive for a 16 seed in my opinion their style of play is hard to play against so uh evan woola uh, we'll go to your team here first then Purdue faces Grambling State if you watch the uh, game at all you know Penn State fan there uh, he's right it is kind of an interesting style they were down 14 at one point mm -hmm. in this game they came back from that tied it up uh, overtime and, and obviously they kind of took over in overtime there Purdue still favored by a lot Ken Palm doesn't feel like this will be a close game but at the end of the day Grambling State looks impressive what are some of your thoughts going into this game Evan? Yeah, Grambling plays. They like to get up and down the floor. Um, they only average 67 points a game, roughly around there. Um, I mean, really with this game, obviously coming off of last year's uh, embarrassing loss to FDU, I'm definitely probably a lot more nervous than I should be for a one versus 16. Um, but hey, that's life as a fan. Um, I mean, it really all it starts and you know starts and ends with Zach Eady. You know, they're not, they're not going to have anybody that they can match up against with him. Um, just matter, you know, he'll get his, but just it really comes down to. You know, does Purdue turn the ball over or not? Um, when Purdue takes care of the ball, no one, no one has really done a has been able to really beat them all year. Um, but it's when they get into games where they're getting you know 14 plus turnovers. I mean, Nebraska blew their doors off because you know Purdue was turning the ball over and Nebraska was able to get out and run. Um, Ohio State was able to turn Purdue over. Northwestern was able to turn Purdue over. Wisconsin was in the Big Ten tournament. So as long as Purdue doesn't beat Purdue, I I like a Purdue shot um, to hopefully. Very uneventful game on Friday because if it's uh, like a 10 point game at halftime, I'm not sure how I'm going to handle it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what you want. You want it to be like, ah, this game is over by halftime. Uh, not much of a one to watch, kind of a snooze. Right. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I have a feeling I was talking, I was listening to some Purdue fans talk, and they were thinking that probably just with the way this game is lined up in the time slot, it's probably going to be one of the more watched one versus 16 just because of what happened last year. But I'm hoping that after about five minutes, everybody can turn the game off because it's, it's uh, hopefully in hand pretty early on. But. That's making yeah. me, I'm, I still sweat it out. Yeah, that's what you want. And uh, if you look at the stats, Grambling State, they, they are a fairly high steal percentage team. So mm -hmm. this is a team that is able to turn the other team over. Now, I think that some of the issues with turnovers from last year have not come in the same ways when uh, mm -hmm. you know Purdue lost to Ohio State that was more Zach Eady turning the ball over which was right. kind of crazy the ways that uh, Zed Key was able to poke yeah, the ball he worked out of, yeah, he worked yeah Zach Eady's hands yeah. I've never seen anything like that happen before to Zach yeah. Eady I mean like maybe a few times here and there but never consistently in a game like yeah. that so yeah Zed did a really um, good job yeah it was kind of a weird one so I don't take that one is like a huge issue, um, but I guess if it happened once, it could always happen again. So mm -hmm. uh, kind of an interesting point there. But I mean, at the end of the day, as long as Braden Smith plays kind of his cool, calm, collected self, he doesn't mm -hmm. struggle too much with the injury. I know some Purdue fans were concerned about that. 
with the Wisconsin game. However, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was that bad. I think it was just kind of a run back from Wisconsin. You have any thoughts yeah. on that, Evan? Yeah, I mean, I was obviously the when it when Braden went down Michigan State, my you know, every Purdue fan life flashed for their eyes. Uh, flashes of Robbie Hummel in 2010 came up again, um, but thankfully he was able to come back in. Um, I mean, he the fact that he played like 35 minutes against Wisconsin, it was he, he looked fine to me. He was he wasn't skying for rebounds like he normally does, but again, that, that could have just been him being more just you know cautious. Um, but now that he's going to have almost a full week of rest, hopefully he should be pretty good good to go. I mean, Matt Painter was on. Uh, I I live in Indianapolis, and he was on. Indy radio yesterday and he said that he you know Braden's totally fine so not to worry about there one guy I'm a little I am there's some concern of is Lance Jones this will be his first NCAA tournament appearance as a player obviously being at uh Southern Illinois before he's had a tendency in some big games to get a little overzealous and kind of gets ahead of himself tries to do, do a little too much so hopefully you know the other guys around him can kind of calm him down because obviously he's gonna be amped up um but um because he i mean the nice thing about lance is he doesn't have a conscious when it comes to shooting because that's what kind of played Purdue last year in the fdu game is no one wanted to shoot um but sometimes lance just needs to uh reel it in a little bit but it's the lance jones experiment experience so well and that's the difference with purdue this year is they have mm -hmm. that three-point shooting that they didn't have as consistently mm -hmm. last year and uh i think fletcher lawyer seems to have that confidence that he didn't have at the end of last year. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, they finished up about, I think, finished the season second in the country with a three point percentage behind Kentucky. So, a lot better than what they were last year. They were probably around like 32, 33 percent. So, it's been a world of difference. Yeah, for sure. Blake, going into this game, man, obviously you guys uh, had the magic formula to beat Purdue at some point this season as well. That, now that was at home and, uh, you know, Casey Tomanaga kind of went crazy, which you always love to see that happen. Yep. Just the team overall went crazy from three in that game. But uh, uh, you, you've probably watched Purdue a little bit this season. What are your thoughts going to the NCAA tournament for them? I mean, honestly, let's let's call it what it is. If Purdue loses this game, like someone needs – someone's head needs to come off because they're <laughs> absolutely – I'm going to be the voice of reason here. There's no reason Purdue should ever lose this game, given the storylines, given the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the momentum, given the, the track record that get that they've had, given the returning starters they've had from last year with the sour taste in their mouth. I mean, Grambling state, whoever it may be in Emporia state that Purdue's going to win this game. I, and if they yeah. don't, then the world might explode. I mean, I, there's, I don't know that there's really much more to say. You won't hear from me. I can tell you that. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet on Purdue Twitter yeah. for a little while. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, this Grambling State team, they, they're not super good rebounding. They don't have a whole lot of size down low. So I, I, honestly, as long as Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer and Lance Jones, those kind of ball handler guys are able to get the ball up the court and not turn it over and be okay with it, Zach Eady should get his and uh, mm -hmm. the three-point shooting should be experienced enough in this game yeah. that um, – that, that you should be able to see Zach Eady kick out if he does get double or maybe even triple team too. We'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Evan, uh, you know, I'll ask for your prediction. I think I know who you're going to predict is going to win, but do you have a score yeah. prediction to go along with that as well? Yeah, actually, my score was kind of a little closer to what Ken Palm was. I was going to say Purdue 84, Grambling State 68. Um, feeling it'll be a, you know, around, around a 30 point, you know, um, mark but then hopefully the walk-ons can come in and probably give up a bunch of buckets as they tend to do this year in the big games but i'll take it very good blake what about you man i i really don't think that purdue is gonna if there's ever been a one seed that is not going to sleepwalk into a game it's this purdue team in 2024 mm -hmm. so um you know i don't know what that spread is off the top of my head it's probably somewhere right in that you know 20 some odd point range and obviously as we know for you know uh fdu was a similar spread last year. Mm -hmm. We talked about the tallest team versus the shortest team in the NCAA. I'm sure Evan's tired of hearing that by now. <laughs> but th that's not going to happen this year. I'm, I'm going to go Purdue 86, Grambling 60 by a very wide margin with no question so Evan can sleep at night. Please. <laughs> Hey, listen. I picked I picked Purdue in the in the bracket that we did live here on the channel with Jay with uh, Brant and Sunny. We picked Purdue to win it all. So you know what? Let's let's start it off hot. <laughs> I'm going to pick Purdue to win ninety to sixty. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. You better get it done. Don't put the walk ons in, Matt. Okay. Let <laughs> them play. Destroy them. Crush their spirits. And uh, don't let sixteen seeds ever think that they can beat another number one seed ever again. <laughs> Watch North Carolina or some other. Right, so I'll welcome another one seed losing as long as it's not Purdue. I'll I'll yeah. welcome him with open arms. Hey, if you keep the match going though with Virginia last year, then it's like every one seed is going to want to lose. Right, yeah. Like, yeah. All right, let's make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
All right, let's move on to Blake's team. Nebraska, the eight seed versus the nine seed, Texas A&M. I know, I know, Trev Albert's bowl, whatever. Um, I feel like it's been talked about every single way possible. Blake, I'm sure you really don't care to mention it all that much, so I mentioned it off the top for you there. I said it, uh, so the, you know, Everybody can be happy that it's said, but Blake, going into this game, man, uh, I know Texas A&M, they don't shoot very well, but they do have some uh, good offense rebounding. Nebraska, obviously a much better shooting team. Rebounding is good for Nebraska, but obviously not on the level of Texas A&M. What are your thoughts going into this one, man? So first you have to set the stage, right? If you haven't heard already to listeners or you guys, then I'm you must be on Mars. Nebraska has never won an NCAA tournament game. So let's get that out of the way now. Let's get your jokes out. Yes, Nebraska has never won a tournament game. That being said, this is probably their best opportunity to do so since the 1997 season. So um, a lot of Husker faithful are very confident about going into this game. I think there's been a ton of breakdowns and, and you know, we obviously released our podcast and, and all kinds of things on Husker Twitter about – uh, why Nebraska should be pretty good in this game and and fr- from an outlook perspective, have a great chance of getting that first tournament win. Now, um, from the people that have reached out to us, just speaking to myself, I think there's going to be a huge Husker contingent in Memphis. And I think that will play to Nebraska's big advantage. Um, some people are already trying to like game plan for Houston. If you know anything about Nebraska, you should not be doing that. So we are strictly talking about Texas A&M and we'll deal with that beast if and when we get there. But AM is a very much enigma of a basketball team. So I like to compare them to like a, a Maryland with the with two caveats in that number one, they are not as good on defense as Maryland is. And number one, they are much better offensive rebounders than Maryland. So uh, but but the team construct is roughly the same. They have one go-to guy that's gonna basically shoot half of their shots in uh, uh, Wade, I think is his name. Wade Davis Taylor. Wade, Wade Taylor. Um, he destroyed Ohio State. I'm right on the wrong page of my notes, but <laughs> Wade, Wade Taylor, he's a first team all SEC guy. He's the absolute guy on that team. It, it's very interesting because, as you mentioned, their shooting is pathetic. They're 353rd in the country in three point percentage, they're 301st in the country in two point percentage, and they're 234th in the country in free throw percentage. So, this team is awful shooting the ball. I mean, it's awful, but they offset that. And the reason they're a top 40 or 50 offensive team based on efficiency is because they get so many second chance points from the offensive rebounding side and they attack the glass like nobody else in the country can. I mean, they're first nationally that is first, not in conference nationally in offensive rebounding percentage as they get their own rebound on 42% of their shots. So you talk about weaknesses in Nebraska's kink or chink in the armor. If if you will, Nebraska is not a great defensive rebounding team. They're 223rd nationally in defensive rebounding. So the, the game plan from the Aggie standpoint is to let Wade Taylor get up his shots and he's going to shoot his and some of them will go in. Most of them won't as he's not a very efficient shooter. Um, I think he's shooting like 32% from three and like just over 40% from the field. So again, more of like a, a Jameer Young sense. And then again, he's just a volume guy. He's not necessarily going to make every shot, but he's going to take them all. So in- inevitably his number is going to be good. Um, but, but he's going to have one of the best uh, down low rebounders in the country in uh, Anderson Garcia, he's our six, seven senior shooting 55% from the field and 44% from three on only 18 attempts, but he's on the all sec defensive team. He's eighth in the conference in sec or in steel percentage 17th in the conference in block percentage. And he's 15th nationally and second in the conference in personal offensive rebounding percentage. So the guy's an absolute monster. He's an absolute monster. And he does a lot of that dirty work for him down low. So I think a and is probably going to out-rebound Nebraska. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But can you limit yourselves to only getting out-rebounded by a doable margin? And if when you do get out-rebounded, not drop your head and give up. Because this is seriously is like an effort game from Nebraska's standpoint. Because they're going to beat you on the glass. I mean, you, they're going to beat you on the glass. But you can't let that affect your confidence on defense and let it affect your confidence then on offense. right? But speaking to Nebraska versus AM on the offensive side, that you could not have asked for a better tournament matchup, especially on the eight, nine game line. I mean, th- this is drawn up absolutely perfectly for the way Nebraska plays on offense. a and is 351st nationally. There's only 362 teams in the nation. They're 351st nationally in defensive three point attempts for field goal attempts. Opponents are scoring 37.4% of points from the three, which is 10th most in the country on the Aggies. As we all know, what does Nebraska do? They chuck threes. That's their that's their number one goal. That's what the offense is built around. Mass, even their five guy, comes out and plays on the perimeter. So we don't even have a true uh, center in that sense. Now, Mass can score a little bit, as unfortunately JR saw. as he, I think he went for like 30 or something against Ohio State back in January. But 
but the offense is not predicated on that kind of play. It, it'll chip in from here and there, but that's not how the Huskers are built. So this AM defense is all right from a shooting perspective. They're uh, 183rd nationally in three-point defense, 139th nationally in two-point defense. Um, they're just average at a lot of things. They'll they'll be a little risky. They'll try to jump steals here and there, but it hurts them horribly if they're not able to convert the steal as they're 350th. Again, 362 teams we're talking about. 350th nationally in defensive assists per field goal made at a whopping 60% of opponent shots are made off of an assist when you play against Texas A&M. So again, from Nebraska's perspective, offensively, you couldn't have drawn it up any better. Defensively, probably going to be a big problem. So um, that's why you see a projected Ken Palm spread of minus two at 74 to 72. Um, it's kind of a strength on weakness, strength on weakness uh, kind of game on both sides of the floor. So should be a very interesting game, but at the end of the day, I think this one means a hell of a lot more to Nebraska, a hell of a, a lot more to their fan base, and I think a hell of a lot more to the team. As this team has talked all year in the press conferences, as we followed the beat of it all year, is they want to do something that no other team in Nebraska has ever done, and that's win a tournament game. Well, now they did the hard part. They're there. So now it's almost like the stress is off. You got in the tournament first time in 10 years, second time since 1997. So the, the stress is off. It's time to do what they set out to do from the get-go, and I feel really good about it. A lot of other people feel really good about it. And uh, I'm, I'll say my score prediction for later after you ask me, but I feel really good about Nebraska's chances in this one. Yeah, no, I, I feel good about Nebraska too. I think overall, like I know Fred Hoiberg doesn't have the best history in the NCAA tournament, even going back to when he was at Iowa State and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like I feel like Fred Hoiberg has like almost kind of reinvented himself when he got to Nebraska. Like when he first got to Nebraska, he was basically trying to do everything the same way he did with Iowa State. And I think he, learned in the first three or four years it's like this isn't going to work and so he did kind of have a doubter year uh there for a while when he was trying to recruit the right guys to come in and the right transfers to come in for the style of play that he wants but i mean he's got the right guys now i mean maybe they're not the most athletic guys in the world however i think juan gary is pretty darn athletic um <laughs> uh, but I, I mean so but rank you know you got ranked mass who he is very reliable but i mean blake you tell me man i've been wondering this all season long and i've not had many nebraska fans to ask this to but like isn't he just like a dad on the court? I mean, he's playing out there with like the knee brace thing and everything like, and just kind of the Mouth way he guard, moves. Yeah. yeah. Like I love <laughs> it, man. I just, I want to be like daddy mast or something like, out there. I mean, does anybody in the breast? Oh, I don't know about, about that. that but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is anybody talking about how like this guy looks like he's just like this older veteran, like player out there. But at the end of the day, like he's carving guys up. Like when he played against Ohio state and he carved us up, I was like, well, you can't, I mean, you can't do anything about that when the dude's just really good. I mean, I, I don't know what, what, what do Nebraska well, fans it, think it about very right interesting because I think it's pretty safe for me to go out on a limb and say he's the most unathletic five man in the league. And, and I don't know <laughs> who would be more unathletic. And, and to that point, he has had one dunk all year, one. And it was like in garbage time when he had nobody in his way and he barely even got the rim. I, he's the guy is six ten, and he can't dunk. It's some of the craziest stuff you've ever seen in your life, but his game is totally based around exactly what Fred Hoiberg wants a five guy that can not necessarily make 40% from deep, but enough that you have to respect it. Right. So you're talking like 33, 34%. You're not super freaking out if he takes a shot, but it might go in. And if he makes his first two or three, you better go cover him. And then what does that inevitably do? Open up those backdoor cuts because nobody's in the middle and allows Fred to really run the offense how they want. So, but speaking to masks, you know, dad, like, if you want to, you know, at least if you want to call it that hundred percent agree, he's a very gruff dude. Um, early this season, he got into like some fight with some, I don't, the, the details of the story never came out, but if you remember at the start of the year, he was wearing a big face mask. Cause I think he like fractured his nose or some, cause some guy like really shot at him right in the jaw or whatever happened. I don't know Jeez. what happened, but the details never came out. So he came out with a mask. And then after the Kansas State game, he had to get a, a, a knee surgery done, very light to clean up like some old thing that was going on with him, cartilage or something or other. So he's playing with a knee brace, and on top of that, he can't wow. dunk. And, but the, <laughs> the, the caveat to this is that he is a junior eligibility, so he could come back again. So, no uh, so you're probably going to see him again as long as Kansas doesn't lure him out with $100 million of NIL. <laughs> um, you know, I'm but that's, that. I mean, honestly, like, yeah, Matt, Mast has, has been the product of what has kind of gotten this thing going. Um, we went to a taller lineup against Northwestern there in like late January, early February um, to help with some of the massive rebounding problems that we've been having uh, since then. 
with Juwan Gary in the starting lineup, it's it's been a godsend. And mass scoring has been down over the last couple of weeks, but um, it's been a product of not, him maybe not hitting as an efficient flip as we are kind of used to him seeing, especially in that Ohio State game. But he he's the guy that makes this all work because if you don't have a five guy in Fred's offense that can stretch the floor, it totally defeats the purpose. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska, like, they have good defensive rebounding. I think they're in the 96th percentile of defensive rebounding. So, like, they do a good job with defensive rebounding. It's just the offensive rebounding, uh, less than 10 offensive rebounds a game. Just, I mean, you, you'd like to see more in that area. But, of course, when you're when you're shooting threes and things like that, it's hard to, you know, uh, get the right angle for the rebounds and try to get those things. And especially when you have a guy like Rank Mast who is questionable whether or not he can dunk, you know, as your five-man probably not going to be the best offensive rebounder in the world but like we said he, he has other areas that he really really excels in so uh evan your thoughts on nebraska versus texas a and just going into this uh, uh what have you seen from nebraska this year have you seen texas a and at all all that stuff i mean what are your thoughts going into this game i haven't seen a ton of texas a and um my friend group we have a running joke that we all just hate buzz williams for whatever dumb reason hate that he wears stupid vests on the sidelines um me too uh, when there was when there was stuff out there about buzz williams might be the ohio state head coach i I (laughs) want to die i mean what he ran onto the court was it the tennessee game or something he was like trying to call a timeout he was just like antics like that so i'm not a big buzz williams fan but i love nebraska i've loved watching nebraska all year um love watching their offense i mean i've been a big fan of toby naga since last year um so i hope i hope for nebraska fans sake i hope he gets the opportunity to become america's favorite in this tournament with a couple games um but yeah i mean if, if they're hitting no one it's gonna be tough to beat them um i mean i know obviously a and really good at offensive rebounding but threes are more than two so if they can keep bombing away from three then I think it'll be a really fun game to watch. Um, so there's one when I've done my brackets throughout, like I'm always picking Nebraska for this game because I, I said I've always just really enjoyed watching them play this. My this man, my it, man. Aside from aside from one game this year, I've enjoyed even then I was enjoying Tommy Tom Nog in that game still. Um when they were whooping Purdue. But yeah, it's it's uh they've been probably one of my second favorite teams to watch this year in the Big Ten. And I'm a Hoiberg fan too, so I think this was my favorite interaction of the day on the chat. Phil said Nebraska to the Sweet 16. Evan Dub said, Philip, I think I love you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad that we have uh, Illinois fans and Nebraska fans combining. And uh, a good compliment here from uh, Ryan F for you, Blake. He says, I'm an Illini fan, but I love Blake Pod. You guys do a great job. So uh, nice to Appreciate that, Ryan. Like that. Yeah. Uh, all right, Blake, let's get into prediction then. I think I know who you're going to pick to win the game, but uh, what's your score prediction on top of that? There's no other answer than Nebraska for me in this one. I mean, the, for the first time in 10 years, you can't pick anybody but Nebraska. Um, <clears throat> I think this, again, we're going to see a team in AM that's similar to Maryland with worse defense but better rebounding. I think Nebraska has the ability to play to their strength in offense, and Nebraska's rebounding or or more preventing of offensive rebounds has gotten, again, a lot better since we went to the taller lineup. So not as bad as we were in January. So I think we should be okay. I mean, we out-rebounded Rutgers at the end of the year in uh, in Lincoln. So, and, you know, obviously they have some guys that are really hard to keep off the glass. So, again, Nebraska improving on that side of the floor. But, again, the big Husker contingent, the, I mean, Memphis is going to be Lincoln what, Lincoln East. I, th- this place mm-hmm. is going to be just covered to the brim in in red. So, and plus some of those hopefully are probably Houston guys that want to play AM and not Nebraska. So, um, but, no, I, I feel really good about Nebraska. I'm going to go 79 to 71 Huskers, and then uh, then you're going to see an even bigger contingent of red in Memphis <laughs> on Sunday's game. I love it. I love it. Evan, your uh, prediction? Yeah, I was in Nebraska, 82 to 71. Ooh. I like it. My man. That's even more than I had. <laughs> so I, so I love, I, I mean, I love Tommy Naga. Like my wife is a, is a Indiana graduate. So your guys' game oh. in the big tournament was not a, she, she probably favorite. doesn't like Tommy Naga. She does, no, she, she does not. No, but I was like, I was like, if you go to our Twitter feed, like during that game, I was just, I love Tommy Naga so much. Just like, just his, he's never met a shot. He didn't like, Um, it's the, he's like, what, who was it? It was someone on the broadcast was like, we don't want his, it was, oh, it was Bruce Weber said he didn't want his sons to watch Tommy Naga play because he, he doesn't take a good shot, but it goes in. So I don't care. It's just, it's so much fun to watch. The best show on hardwood. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, so yeah, I actually am going to be closer with Evan on my prediction. I think Nebraska comes out just firing away. I think that this is going to be kind of an offensive explosion from them. I think that Texas A&M, their three-point shooting is not going to be able to keep up. I think obviously, you know, they they probably are going to win the offensive rebounding battle, which will keep them in the game much more. But let's be honest, threes are more than twos, and at the end of the day, Nebraska is better at hitting those threes than Nebraska than uh, than Texas A&M is. So I'm going to pick. <laughs> Nebraska in this one to win 85 to 78. I think it's going to be a high scoring game. Uh, I also love this comment here from DJ feeling good about getting past a and the next game against Longwood. <laughs> it could be close though. So, Hey, we had six teams to beat ones before. So, I, you know, so I would love to see yeah. Houston. Houston is one of the teams I hate the most and I really don't have any rational reason for it. I just don't like them. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. And hey, just to sneak this in quick, if Nebraska does play Houston, the formula to beating these heavy defensive teams, three-point shooting. So just yeah. saying, if you're looking for a shocker. <laughs> shocker. Uh, I actually said at the beginning, I said, man, if Nebraska for some reason falls to the eight seed line, I said this on a podcast, I said if for some reason Nebraska falls to an eight seed line, which I didn't think was possible, but – Obviously, it happened. If they do fall to an eight seed line, I said if they're going to play a one seed, they need to play Houston because Houston is the most, you know, the best matchup for them to be able to beat them. And lo and behold, here we are. If Nebraska wins, they could be playing Houston or Longwood, as DJ pointed out. So, yeah, as an eight seed, you couldn't have drawn up a better little regional. So, we're excited about Mm -hmm. it. Uh, all right, guys, we do have a commercial really fast, about a minute long. So, we're going to watch this commercial and then we'll come back and we'll do the Michigan State game. Looking to rep your alma mater or your favorite team in style? Look no further than Home Field. Home Field, based in Indianapolis, is your go-to destination for premium collegiate apparel. With a passion for comfort and a flair for vintage design, Home Field brings you officially licensed gear that is cozy as it is stylish. With over 150 colleges to choose from, Home Field digs deep into the archives, uncovering forgotten logos, iconic mascots, and legendary moments to create apparel that is truly one of a kind. Head on over to homefieldapparel.com. Use my code TBTH for 15% off for new, new customers or use my link in the description. If you're a serious college basketball fan, you need CBB Analytics. CBB Analytics isn't just another stat site. It's the ultimate destination for in-depth basketball analysis. Used by fans and coaches alike, CBB Analytics delivers stats that you won't find anywhere else. It has comprehensive stats for men's and women's basketball across Division 1 through 3, dating all the way back to 2018. From shooting percentages to game recaps, CBB Analytics has it all. Head on over to cbbanalytics.com with their user-friendly interface and extensive selection. You'll have all the stats you need right at your fingertips. Don't miss out. Try CBB Analytics for free or pay for your pro tier for your basketball knowledge to grow to the next level. CBB Analytics, where every stat tells a story and every game is a masterpiece. All right, very good. Back to the Big Ten huddle. We are going to be talking about Michigan State, Mississippi State. Uh, I think both teams in their, like I've heard SEC fans talking, they're saying Mississippi State is fraudulent. I hear Big Ten teams talking, they're saying Michigan State is fraudulent. So I think we found like the most fraudulent teams from each conference, and now we've combined them to uh, see who plays most likely North Carolina next. This is going to be an interesting game. Michigan State, obviously, uh, they have had a hard time with uh, playing basketball at points this season. (laughs) I don't know what else to put it. Their defense is good, but obviously the front court is just not there. Maddie Sissoko, they've been kind of rotating guys in and out. Did you guys see Carson Cooper's mask thing he has on? Mm -hmm. Like. <laughs> okay, the the nose it looks like a beak. Like <laughs> I guess he broke his nose or something. And the note I I wish I had a picture of it. But go Google like a, it. Like a Doctor Death mask from the Plague Era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's it's very interesting. So uh, I think he's supposed to wear it in the game. So even if you don't Google it, you'll you'll see it in the game. Uh, but this is actually the first game of the entire tournament mm-hmm. tomorrow. So uh, fun for Michigan State to open it all up, and everybody gonna have their eyes on that. But uh, overall, I mean. You have Mississippi State, who they, they have a good defense as well. This could kind of turn into the uh, Virginia-Colorado State game that we saw <laughs> earlier. God, no. Here. Please, God, no. <laughs> but, 
at the end of the day, uh, according to conference fans, frauds versus frauds. Blake, what are your thoughts on the frauds? Well, you know, a lot of people outside of Big Ten circles, obviously, thought that Michigan State should have played in that first four game as opposed to Colorado State. And I think a lot there's a lot of commotion about the committee kind of bending over the Mountain West, uh, for lack of a better term. But if you look at this matchup, Michigan State is a defensively based team with a, a good offense. Not great, but good offense. You know, they're hitting 36 percent of their threes. They're hitting 50 percent of their twos, which is pretty run of the mill average ish in the country. Mississippi State, on the other hand, is very turnover prone on offense to a Michigan State team that is very uh, good on defense and can take the ball away. So I think that's that's um, advantage to the Spartans in this one. Um, it's hard to say, you know, Michigan State doesn't really have a ton of weapons, They, which isn't necessarily out of the realm of normality for Tom Izzo. But, I mean, pretty much everything runs through uh, Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogard in general. And then Malik Hall will con- you know, c- kind of contribute as he goes. But there's not a ton of weapons on this Michigan State team, especially down low. So, you know, I, I don't know a ton about Mississippi State. Obviously, we've heard constantly that they're they're frauds and this, that, and the other, and, and things like that. But, you know, I, it, Mississippi State is not a very good offensive team, and Michigan State is a pretty damn good defensive team. So, you know, and we talk about is though you don't want to be a, a basic normie and say, oh, well, Tom is doing March. But, like, seriously, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of conversation about him going into retirement very, very soon. Um, so, so I, I, I think Michigan state's going to be ready. Izzo's made the tournament, what, 28 straight years or something like that. So, um, you don't do that without being playing good basketball in March. So, uh, I like Michigan state this one, but very, very close. Yeah. Mississippi state has a, has a pretty good guard in Josh Hubbard. Uh, he's either a red shirt freshman or a true freshman. I can't remember. I think he's a true freshman, but, uh, you know, he's a little five ten guy plays off the ball. Uh, well, he will play on ball and be their ball handler, but I think he's more of their secondary ball handler for this team, but, uh, he's a pretty good scorer. shoots about 44% from the two point range, 36% from three. Doesn't take, he takes a good amount. I mean, almost 300 threes on the season. So, uh, he's shooting a good amount there, but, at the end of the day, I mean, when Mississippi State, when they're probably their main contributor, I think, is a, a true freshman in this one, a guy that's a little 5'10 guy. I think Tyson Walker, A.J. Hogard, uh, you know, even Jaden Akins, I, sh- I think that combo of those three should be able to take care of him. Obviously, they're not going to stop him completely, but uh, his undersized uh, nature and things like that, I think that this is a pretty good matchup for uh, for for Michigan State, and at the end of the day, Malik Hall. I mean, he should eat in this one. Their their four man is not the greatest defender in the world. Good defender, don't get me wrong. Uh, they have a good defense, but he's not like the the anchor of this defense, from what I see. So uh, I look for a good Malik Hall game here to kind of help them out. But uh, Evan, I'm curious your thoughts on the matchup. Any of the players you think about? Anything like that, Evan? Yeah, no, I was thinking going into this game thinking that Malik Hall was kind of the X factor for this one. Um, but also, I mean, with Michigan State, they've got vet- a lot of veteran guard play with, like like we said, with Hogard and Walker. Um, I mean, they we saw it last year. They were pretty, you know, a little better than mediocre, but they made a Sweet 16 run. Um, it wouldn't shock me if they do it again this year. Maybe a little bit less because they obviously have to play uh, North Carolina next. But, um, yeah, it's hard to bet against Izzo in March as much as I hate saying it because I hate the guy. But, yeah, I mean, Walker is a hell of a player and Izzo is a hell of a coach, and I definitely think they'll get this one done for sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, it's his own March. We'll see uh, We'll see what happens. But I do like the matchup for him with North Carolina mm-hmm. coming up. North Carolina has a freshman uh, primary ball handler, which, you know, is always yep. something that you have to be on the lookout for when – when uh, you're in the NCAA tournament, and so I think they have good players around him, but at the end of the day, that could be that could be an issue there. Uh, Blake, your thoughts, uh, prediction, who you think is going to win if you have some kind of score prediction for us? Well, another you know similarity to this Nebraska game is Mississippi State is based a lot around, again, pretty poor shooting in general, but they pound the offensive glass. They're 21st mm-hmm. nationally in offensive rebounding percentage, but they don't even make the free throws as they're only shooting 67% <laughs> from the line, which is good for 324th in the country. So – um, you know, again, we've already talked about it. Malik Hall, they're four, and, and uh, whoever they trot out at the five, I think Sissoko's been getting some time down there amongst maybe – I think there's a five-star center. I pre- I don't keep up with Michigan State basketball a ton. But, yeah, um, got, you know, yeah, they got Xavier Booker, yeah. But but at, at the end of the day, I, I think Michigan State, and again, Izzo is able to win this one in March, but I'm going to go a, a very ugly game. I'm going to go Michigan State 61, Mississippi State 58. <sighs> Dang. <laughs> Looking for some and I'm, I'm not going to watch enough. it. I'm not going to watch yeah. it. <laughs> I veto the first game of the tournament. Give me the next one. Uh, 
Philip here asked a good question. Is Walker going to be healthy enough to make play the plays necessary? Um, I don't know the extent of Walker's injury right now. Obviously, they are not keeping super up to date in that. I don't think he looked terrible in the Big Ten tournament. I think he looked okay against Mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota. I think that, you know, obviously Michigan State's offense has been down with uh, his offensive struggles and the uh, the injury that's been harping on him there. But at the end of the day, I mean, he got rest. So hopefully he's been, you know, uh, getting healthy and things like that. But we'll see. I mean, that Big Ten tournament, no matter what, was going to be uh, was going to be tough for him playing games back to back to back. But uh, maybe it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise. They they got their first game just enough to to make the tournament and go on from there. But uh, I don't think it'll be the biggest issue in the world I'm hoping, but I could also be wrong because I don't have any super good inside information there. So yes, I do. Yeah. He's had a groin injury for a few weeks. So we'll see. We'll see if that heals up here. Evan, your thoughts and prediction on the game. I think it's gonna be a tight one. Um, I think Michigan state pulls it out of 68, 64 free throws late. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I think uh, I'm kind of more with Blake on the lower scoring game. I could see it being a game where one of the teams is held under 60. I could honestly see a game where both of them are held under 60. I could see this being a game where it's like 22 to 24 and at the end of the first half or something like that. And just kind of a real stalemate defensive game. And, uh, you know, maybe not the prettiest game in the world. I'm sure this will be one that people kind of check back in for the last two minutes of the game and just see what happens. But, uh, at the end of the day, probably not a whole lot of, uh, offensive fireworks here i'm gonna go with you know something around the lines of like 59 to 55 i'm gonna pick michigan state in this one but at the end of the day yeah right blake uh but at the end of the day like tyson walker that injury like that does affect things too like if tyson walker is not himself uh i could see mississippi state pulling ahead and win this one so we'll see battle of the frauds see who uh wins here and Michigan State fans I'm just messing with you on the frauds thing it's okay I don't hate you so I've been accused of hating Michigan State throughout the season (laughs) all right here we go Illinois Moorhead State guys we have the three versus 14 matchup this was a one that a lot of analysts were looking at as possibly being a uh, upset pick when they were doing the selections show uh this one and the next game we'll talk about Wisconsin James Madison I um I don't really see it Moorhead State to me kind of plays the same game that Illinois does just with not as good of athletes. I think that they have a couple players on their team that are kind of on the athletic level and kind of the length level of Illinois, but I don't think their entire team is that way. I mean, obviously if Moorhead state gets hot from three and start shooting really well, Illinois could be in trouble, but I actually still think Illinois is a better defensive team than Moorhead state is. And even though Moorhead state can kind of keep the pace and keep up with Illinois, that, hasn't really been the formula to beat Illinois this season. If you try to keep pace with them and normally Illinois will out Illinois you, <laughs> and, uh, you'll lose. So Evan going into this game, what are your thoughts, man? Yeah. So um, I've seen Moorhead state twice this year because they played at Purdue and they played Indiana. Um, Purdue beat them by 30 at Mackey. And then they uh, Moorhead state actually lost by one at Indiana. So they almost were able to get uh, a victory over a big 10 team. Um, they love to slow it down. Um, Minix is their best player. He's a hell of a player. He's like six seven, uh, but Illinois has got size everywhere um, from top to bottom. So I don't see Illinois having too much trouble in this game unless they just decide to not play defense for whatever reason. Um, but if they're locked in, I think it'll be a pretty easy win for them, um, especially if, if Shannon is going off like he has the whole last weekend. Um, but I mean, yeah, Illinois, they're just they're physical. Um, they can get hot from three. And they've got one of the best players in the country, obviously. Yep. I, uh, I feel like kind of the same way. Blake, what are your thoughts, man? Yeah. You know, I, all I'm going to tell Illinois fans is just beware. Don't, don't assume you're going to win this game. Moorhead can play some basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't go 26 and eight without playing some good basketball. I don't care what conference you're in. Um, as you talked about Indiana, a game, I faintly remember, I'm pretty sure they led for a a long time in that game. They were up 15. Yeah. They were up 15. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say it was like a late Illinois push that won that game. So, um, Moorhead, I mean, Moorhead should have walked into assembly, which, you know, a lot of teams have done this year, but but like, I mean, that's meaningful, especially for a team in the Ohio Valley. So, you know, that being said, Illinois, obviously offensively is just, you know, back in uh, the target center, as I was in the, the building for that Nebraska, Illinois semifinal, all we heard constantly is the freight trains coming, the freight trains coming. It's like, Jesus. Yeah. Right to the free throw line. So, you know, it's, 
Illinois is, is really good at what they do. They find the mismatch and they drive and they take you one on one in, in an ISO and they get to the foul line. They're they're extremely talented that nobody has taken more advantage of the change in the block charge rule than Terrence Shannon as I think against Nebraska in that semifinal game. He had like 18 free throw attempts or something, which and in all honesty, I will tell you, most of them were fouls. He's just really good at initiating that contact and really throwing his head back in a way that looks like he got hit, even though he didn't. But um, but no, Illinois is a really good team. Um you know what, again, what they do on offense and they're a good defensive team too. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, they're really good at stopping the three as they're seventh in the country in defensive three point attempts per field goal attempt. Um, they, they're not going to be super risky. They don't try to turn you over necessarily, but the, you know, they're the 92nd ranked defense uh, in the country from an efficiency standpoint. So, you know, they can hold their own, but they're not, their game is not based on defense. Let's not kid ourselves. What they do is they're going to outscore you again, like you mentioned out Illinois guy. But the, the catch here, which, again, does cause some points of concern maybe for Illinois, is Moorhead State is ninth in the country in effective field goal percentage on defense. So they do a pretty damn good job uh, playing defense. They're 12th nationally defensively in assists per field goals made, and they're 23rd nationally in three-point attempts per field goal attempted only 31% when the national average is 37 So um, Illinois is not a team that, that loves to shoot the three, but you know, they're, they're going to make Illinois work for their buckets. So again, this is not a team that you can just assume Illinois is going to win, um, and take care of. So, um, you know, I, I think there's some cause for concern that said, I think Illinois is going to win this, but not cover the spread. Yeah. I think the thing that I look at uh, that, that I think is in the most favor, excuse me, for Illinois is that Moorhead State does have a hard time with turning the ball over, which if you watched Illinois this season, you know, yes, they play good defense. And I think that part of this is because of the pace they play with is sometimes why teams are able to, you know, score more points on them. However, you know, there's also been instances where the defense just hasn't been there at times. You know, Ohio State early on in the game, defense just wasn't there. Now, when they finally decided to lock down and play good defense, you saw what a really good defensive Illinois team uh, can be. But uh, Illinois doesn't force a lot of turnovers. I mean, in steals, they are getting 6.1%, which is in the second percentile of the nation. One of the worst teams in getting steals. But Moorhead is uh, turning the ball over 16.2% of the time. Obviously, steals are not every single turnover, but 16.2% of the time they are turning the ball over. So this is a situation where this is something you want to look at, and it will be positive for Illinois, obviously, Moorhead is going to know about that. They're going to try to correct that issue and try to find ways to take care of the ball. However, I mean, if you turn the ball over on Illinois, they're going to get out and run in and they're going to be scoring faster than you can blink. Uh, and so at the end of the day, like you just you can't you can't let that happen. Uh, you can't let Illinois start turning you over, getting steals and getting out the fast break like they like to do. So, Evan, your thoughts on who's going to win this game and a score prediction? Yeah, I wonder if it's going to be like. I mean, I, I've, I've got a really good friend who's an Illinois fan, and he uh, he lo- he loves this team, but he hates the fact that they always get down double digits in the second half. I don't think it's going to happen this game. They may get down double digits in the first half, but I think Illinois ends up pulling it out. Um, final score of eighty three to seventy. All right, what do you think, Blake? Um, I, I think Moorhead is going to really actively try to slow this game down and get Illinois uncomfortable with a lower scoring game. I do not foresee mm-hmm. Illinois going over 85 points in this game as they normally would do. Um, mm-hmm. I got to know uh, the Domask family pretty well over uh, the Big Ten tournament trip. Actually, I have Marcus Domask dad's phone number in my phone and we've been texting, <laughs> which is just the, the craziest development maybe ever because I had some beers <laughs> with the guy at an Irish pub in, in, tar- in the Minneapolis. That's awesome. Um, and got to meet some other family members. And, uh, and it's really cool. So I, I can't pick against Illinois. I, I like the Damask family way too much. Uh, I dapped up uh, Marcus Damask in the Embassy Suites lobby, so I like the guy a lot. Um, I'm going to go Illinois 75, Moorhead 70. Mm, interesting. Ooh. Ooh. I am uh, I am fully on the Illinois getting out and running and uh, scoring as many points as possible. Train, I feel like, you know, Moorhead, they'll probably want to slow the pace down as well too. But, I mean – like even in that Purdue game and Evan, I think you can back me up on this. Like there were times where it was very clear. The game plan was to slow the pace down. And Braden Smith was looking at Matt Painter, like I got to go. And he's like, no, yeah. slow. Like yeah. even, yeah. even if you know, slow the game down, like the way Illinois plays, it's really, really yeah. hard to slow that down unless you just have the self-control to do so. Right. And yeah. I question if Moorhead state has that self-control has that ability. Are they going to be well coached enough to be able to do that? I'm not knocking Moorhead state's head coach here, but at the end of the day, this is a team that, 
probably has not seen a team like Illinois this season. So if they do start turning the ball over and if they do start getting in trouble with Illinois going out in the break and maybe getting up by 10 in the first half or something like that, I could see a situation where Moorhead State tries to run with them and it just kind of gets out of control. Even though Moorhead State is, you know, more attuned to staying at a lower pace, I can see them kind of taking the bait, getting out there, turning the ball over more. So I'm actually going to predict more of a higher scoring game for Illinois. I'm going to say 90 to 75 in this one, Illinois. So we'll see. Uh, Blake, I'll send you a message and uh, we'll uh, see who's right at the end of this one. Maybe both of us will be wrong. Maybe more Hutt State will win. <laughs> I, I have ulterior motives, JR. So. Okay. <laughs> Love it. All right. Go on here to the next game. Wisconsin, James Madison. Like I said, this is another game that the selection uh, show analysts, they were just kind of like drooling at. I think every single one of them said they're going to be picking James Madison to win this game. I know our buddy Scary Alvarez, who was on the last show, uh, he was uh, not happy about that at all. And I get it because uh, even though Wisconsin has had a hard time uh, at times this season, they've also been very, very good this season. I mean, this was a team that we thought had the possibility of a one seed at one point. Uh, and we thought they were going to be a two seed. Obviously, they started falling off a little bit in February, but they did make it to the Big Ten championship game and they were able to uh, stare Purdue in the face and, and take them down. And uh, whether we want to say that was because of some injuries or not or whatever else, I still give massive credit to whatever team mm -hmm. is able to beat Purdue because it, it's only happened four times this season. Uh, so doesn't happen often but at the end of the day I think James Madison is a good team I think they've played a super easy schedule uh they've not uh beat the best teams in the world they had uh they played uh Michigan State earlier this season we just talked about how Michigan State's kind of fraudulent so you know do I give them the most credit for that win no uh but I also can't really give Wisconsin huge credit for their wins over Michigan State if I'm not giving James Madison huge credit for it. But, uh, Blake, let's go to you first here. Your thoughts on Wisconsin's matchup with James Madison. I am extremely worried for the Wisconsin Badgers in this game. They could not have drawn a more nightmare matchup in the James Madison Dukes because, when you, again, when you have a team that has 31 wins and only three losses, the team is good. I don't even care who they played. You win 31 games, you know what the hell you're doing. And it's it shows in the analytics. I mean, they're – now the adjusted efficiency obviously is going to play a role in in um, the opponents, you know, as as we go through some of these numbers. But if you just look at it from a strict number standpoint and take opponent out of it, I mean, they're 40th in the country in three point shooting. They're 40th in the country in two point shooting. They're 44th in the country in uh, offensive steal percentage, meaning they take care of the ball. Um, they're 81st in the country in offensive rebounding. Uh, you know, they're 81st in the country in assists for field goal made. This team just does a lot of things right. And they play pretty quick as they have the 68th fastest offensive tempo uh, in the country as well. So this team had, this team can play basketball and, and, you know, they can play defense too. They're 23rd nationally in effective field goal percentage. They're second nationally in defensive three point percentage. I, mean, this team, uh, this poses a real, real problem for Wisconsin. A lot of people are picking upsets here because, now, I, there's plenty of reason to. Wisconsin, in its own right, is not a great defensive team. They're 275th nationally in effective field goal percentage and 345th nationally in three-point percentage. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about an opportunity here for the Dukes that really is like that they should not be scared of Wisconsin at all. And now, obviously, you know, Wisconsin played really well in the Big Ten tournament. Some people sit here and say, oh, well, now they might be tired. I don't buy into all that stuff necessarily. But, you know, they've been playing better basketball, but we still got to call it what it is. I mean, Wisconsin since February 1st has nine losses. I mean, that's, that's not a normal five seed that we're talking about here. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest again, I'll save my score prediction for after hearing your guys' thoughts, but I, I don't, I do not like Wisconsin in this one. Evan, your thoughts. No, I'm kind of rolling along there with, with Blake. Um, maybe I'm just a little bitter after the big 10 tournament. Um, but yeah, I obviously with Wisconsin kind of careened off a cliff in the month of February, they got hot at the right time for the big 10 tournament. So obviously they look good for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, this James Madison team, obviously we, we saw them go into East Lansing in the beginning of the year and, and take down Michigan state. Um, I guess I've liked this. Madison team. All. Um, Wisconsin, you, you know, wonder maybe I know there was rumors of what, what Chucky Hepburn was hurt. I think he looked fine. In the big 10 tournament, you know, um, Tyler wall was banged up a little bit. Um, you know, you wonder just from playing four games in four days in terms of like the emotion, you know, and then turning right back around and having to kind of obviously now fight for your life. Will that play into it? Um, I so saw we have a comment here about, you know, AJ store. I like AJ store, but also I feel like he has a tendency to play hero ball way too much. Um, and he looks great at one moment. And then the next moment he's, 
you know, costing you points. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, you what you wonder what which AJ store is going to show up for a game. Um, but yeah, I think and I think in the brackets I filled out, I'm usually 50 50 on who I'm picking, um, whether it's the, whether Wisconsin or, or James Madison, because I would not be surprised either way how this game went. Yeah, I think something that we noticed, or at least I've noticed with James Madison here lately, is that they were getting a lot of fast break points early on in the season. I mean, I think they were averaging over 10 fast break points uh, throughout the year. They've only gotten uh, five per game the last five games. So they haven't been out on the fast break nearly as much. They, they're typically a very fast-paced team, but their pace, it seems to have gone down uh, really, really far the past few games. And at the end of the day, Wisconsin, like, if Wisconsin wants to get this team into a slower pace, they're able to make that happen. I mean, that's kind of the way Wisconsin plays basketball. They're not the slowest team out there, but still one of the slower teams in the nation, and one of the slower teams in the Big Ten, which that's saying something. But at the end of the day, I mean, James Madison, it, it, it kind of depends on how well they're able to take the ball to the basket, right? Wisconsin doesn't have a whole lot of rim protection between Stephen Crowell and Tyler Wall. Tyler Wall is actually the leading shot blocker on this team on the year, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, but uh, you know, they don't have a whole lot of, uh, of rim protection in this one. So if James Madison is able to get to the, the bucket, well, they, they do score a lot of paints or points in the paint, 37 points per game in the paint. So that could be an issue for Wisconsin. I'm going to pick Wisconsin to win this one, but I don't feel great about it. Like, I think there's a reason why all the analysts were drooling over this one. I still think Wisconsin finds a way. I still like the way that they're playing basketball right now. And I think if they play their system and they play their game and they dictate the game well, I think they should be able to make it happen. And who knows? Maybe we see, you know, a hot shooting three pointer game uh, from Wisconsin, kind of like we saw them against Maryland and we saw them against Northwestern uh, in the Big Ten tournament. Obviously, that ran out against Purdue, but they were still able to win that one. And they kind of went back to normal about 35% from three against Illinois. So we'll see what happens here. I'm going to pick Wisconsin to win this one 71 to 67. But at the end of the day, like if you guys both pick James Madison in this one, I'm not going to blame you. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to be the best big 10 Homer I can be. So. <laughs> I was waiting for that part. Right. Blake, your prediction. Yeah. Again, I think James Madison poses a ton of problems for Wisconsin. James Madison is going to roll into this game again with that Michigan state road win up in uh, East Lansing confident. They, they're going into this game thinking that they can win this game. Um, I, you know, I think James Madison again, poses a lot of threats to Wisconsin's defense offensively. I don't know if they'll be able to stop some of the things that Wisconsin's going to want to do on offense, but I, I think James Madison is going to win a shootout here. I think I'm going to take James Madison, 81 Wisconsin, 76. Wow. Evan. I have, the, I have the, the same score prediction as you, JR. I had 71 67, but I had uh, James Madison pulling it out. All right. Does it change Does it change your mind at all if I tell you that James Madison is one and two versus Ken Palm top 100 teams this season? Does that change your opinion at all? <laughs> How many of those one, uh, two losses are against teams that lost nine games in the past month and a half? Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, I'm just saying. I'm sorry, Wisconsin fans. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, got me there. They they did they lost to App State twice this year, and App State is what are they seventy nine and Ken Palm, which is uh kind of interesting. But I don't know. I don't. I, I I just don't even know how much credence to give that Michigan State win. I, Michigan State's numbers have baffled me all year long, and <laughs> it's just made me kind of mad. But anyway, all right, last game here. Northwestern and Florida Atlantic, this is where I will stop being a Big Ten homer because as much as I do love Boo Booey and as much as I think that Boo Booey is uh, one of the my favorite guards I've ever seen in Big Ten play, uh, he's losing guys fast around him. Matthew Nicholson, Nicholson will not play in this game. Ty Berry obviously is out for the rest of the season. Uh, we were talking about a, a lingering injury for Tyson Walker. There probably is some kind of lingering li injury still there for Ryan Langborg that he has been going through. Uh, I mean, at this point, like, could Boo Booey have less help <laughs> in this game? And I, I kind of hate it for him, right? Because he, he's had this spectacular career at Northwestern, and he's done so many good things this season. I mean, people have been calling about the Boo Zone and all these different things, and he's just been able to take over games. And uh, I really, really do hate it for him that, you know, I, I don't see a long – you know, tournament run coming to this game uh, because even if they do beat Florida Atlantic here, they have UConn waiting for them, which 
you know, if you know anything about Luke Hunger versus, you know, <laughs> I forget what the big man's name is for UConn, but that is not going to be a pretty matchup if they do play there. But Evan, your thoughts on Northwestern playing Dusty Mays, Florida Atlantic. Um, yeah, kind of what Philip says in the comments, you, you do kind of wonder what FAU team is going to show up. I mean, they've had some really good wins this year. They've had some really head scratching losses. It almost kind of feels like, you know, after their final four run last year, did they just, were they just trying to just get to the tournament so they can, you know, try and repeat again? Do they even really have any interest in the regular season? Um, but like you said, with the, with the injuries of Northwestern, I think it's just gonna be too much for Northwestern to overcome, you know, had, to, had they had, you know, a tie Barry, I, I would probably pick Northwestern in this one. Um, and even it could be, make a really fun matchup against UConn. Um, but I just think with FAU, they've got really good guards. I think it's gonna be just gonna be too much. Boo Boo will go off. He'll get his hopefully. Um, but yeah, unfortunately for him, he's had a great career, but just, it's probably gonna be a one and done. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because I think Boo Boo is another one of those players that could kind of become like a, a tournament star. Oh, 100%. Like a, he's a he's the guy that you'd there. want. Yeah, he's the guy that right. you'd want in a tournament like this. Right. So it is unfortunate, but it is what it is. So, uh, But hey, who knows? Maybe he'll prove me wrong. Blake, your thoughts? Yeah, again, it's the, the very most interesting thing I find about looking at Florida Atlantic's Ken Palm page is they're they're very good on offense in a multitude of things. So, you know, they're 84th nationally in three-point shooting, 17th nationally in two-point percentage, 19th nationally in preventing uh, blocks on offense. They do a lot of things right. 25th nationally in effective field goal percentage and 16th adjusted. So, I mean, they're just killing their opponents offensively. Look, looking at some of these scores, they scored 112 in a game that went to overtime, 102 in regulation, 95 against Wichita State. I mean, these guys could score. 100 against Eastern Michigan earlier this year. So, you know, Northwestern is a very risk-oriented defense. They try to turn you over as much as humanly possible. They jump passing lanes. And it shows in some of their defensive shooting percentages. As you know, they're uh, 316th nationally in three-point defense, 177th nationally in two-point defense. But again, they're 70th nationally in turnover percentage. So they're somewhat successful in what they're trying to do. And I think that number is really high uh, relative to the Big Ten as it differed a lot stylistically from what a lot of the other Big Ten teams do. Um, but again, Northwestern just has so many things going wrong for them with the Barry injury, with the Nicholson injury. I mean, I... I you're not going to beat this Florida Atlantic team with just Boo Booey. I mean, he could score 50, and they're probably not going to win the game. It's, it's. I mean, it's just too much. And this Florida Atlantic team is hungry. They've, they've tasted success. They're not looking past this game. They know what it takes. This is a veteran squad. Um, I like Florida Atlantic to take care of uh, of Northwestern, unfortunately, for Boo Booey and Chris Collins, as he's one of my favorite coaches in the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, Northwestern, like, they were a slow team before this, right? But they have just – absolutely turned down the the slowness factor like I, I i don't have the numbers in front of me but i would not be surprised if their pace of play was the, the slowest in the nation here recently you know the past five games because it seems like every game i watch with northwestern the, the whole idea is just like give the other team the least amount of possessions as possible and try to steal an extra few like you guys were talking about with the uh with the turnovers and stuff so um i i, I don't know I, I it's hard for me to pick against northwestern but with an as offensive inclined team as Florida Atlantic is I mean that uh the uh, Golden Davis Weatherspoon I mean all of those guys like they can all get theirs they can all get their buckets and fortunately unfortunately for Northwestern like Boo Boo is not necessarily a lockdown defender where he's going to take away their best guard and they don't really have great defenders across the board anyway so Unfortunately for Northwestern, I'm going to be picking Florida Atlantic in this to win it, and I'm going to be picking them to score a good amount of points, even though I think Northwestern will try to slow the pace down. I think that FAU will get up to 79, and Northwestern will probably score about 70, 72, but I would not be surprised to see a 40-point game from Boo Booey, you know, scoring mm -hmm. over 50% of their points or something like that, just like trying to refuse his team to lose, but at the end of the day, I I just don't think Boo Booey is a one man show enough to beat a good Florida Atlantic team. Probably not as good as they were last year. I don't think they're going to go to the Final Four, but still a good Florida Atlantic team. Evan, your prediction? Yeah, I had uh, Florida Atlantic seventy six to sixty four. Blake, I'm going right along the same lines. It's, again, it's really unfortunate because Chris Collins is a great coach. This team, at its peak ability, was so good. But when you lose. Again, it's a shallow team. They don't go deep into their bench. So when you lose two guys on top of that, it's your hands are just kind of tied behind your back. So I'm going to predict a Florida Atlantic 75 to Northwestern 58 win, but Boo Booey has uh, 40 of those 58 or whatever I said. Wow. They'll have two thirds of those points. <laughs> Holy crap. I thought I was adventurous talking about a little over 50%, <laughs> but man, I love it. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, honestly, guys, those are all the games we got. So uh, we went through those pretty quick. Well done. Um, you guys have any just any thoughts about the uh, the tournament overall for your teams or anybody else you want to say before we get out of here? Yeah, I mean, to, to again, to Nebraska's point, th- this the entire state, you talk about the state that is, follows football religiously no matter where you're at. The, this Nebraska team has captured a lot of people's hearts. And the way that they play, the way that there's no one guy, people talk about Casey Tomanaga all the time, and, and he's the one that gets the videos and things like that. But, I mean, if you look up and down a roster, last time I checked, I think we had four guys averaging over 12 points a game. So it, it could be anybody's night. And that's that's what makes this team so fun to watch as compared to Husker teams of past, right? Because in the 17-18 team, if you guys recall, you had uh, Isaiah Roby, you had James Palmer, and you had – um, you know, you had like three guys on that team that really, if they didn't get it going, we're going to lose. And back in the 2013, 14 team, the last tournament team Nebraska had, it was Taran Petaway, who was the go-to guy. And then he had Siobhan Shields and, and, you know, a cast of characters really beyond that. So, um, this team is so fun to watch. They can win in so many ways on offense defensively. They've gotten more, you know, better and better all the time. As a matter of fact, I think Ken Palm at this very moment has Nebraska's adjusted deficiency on defense even higher than their offense, which doesn't get talked about enough. That this is a pretty good defensive team. Mm-hmm. So um, Nebraska is is very very excited about this from a team perspective, from a player perspective, from a fan perspective. And uh, this one, if if we win uh, tomorrow or not tomorrow Friday night, uh, I could tell you Lincoln might burn down. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Evan, any thoughts? Uh, I mean, probably gonna be the most stressful. Uh, 116 game probably to ever happen outside of Virginia's game in 2019. Um, but I feel I'm confident in this Purdue team. Um, it's been, you know, throughout the year, whenever Purdue's lost, they've never had a, a winning streak of less than six games following a loss. So I hope to God they can string together six more um, for my, for our fans sake and get back to the final four for the first time since 1980. Very good. Uh, one quick question before we get out of here. We haven't talked much about it just because, been so much going on but uh who does michigan hire philip asked so philip i I have been on the uh boards for michigan a little bit lately and their 24 7 insiders are reporting that uh the top three candidates at the moment seem to be jerome tang dusty may which i don't know i guess why i didn't bring that up when we were just now talking about him but uh, Jerome Tang, Jesse May, and then an NBA assistant. I don't pay any attention to the NBA, so I have no idea who this guy is, but uh, Amir Abdur Rahim. So I don't know if anybody else knows who he is, um, but I think he was a longtime NBA assistant who went to South Florida now this year. Uh, I don't know if he's been there just this year or two years or something like that, but he's not been there very long. And uh, he is another guy that's getting a look there. So, uh, Blake, Evan, do you guys have any thoughts on the Michigan Man, coach I mean, or Jawan Howard or anything? The, the guy <laughs> should just hire me as his PR guy because I'm telling you, that it, it is the best kept secret in college basketball. They need, they should at least give Chris Collins a call and see if if he would leave and go to Michigan because he is the best kept secret in college basketball. What he's able been able to do at Northwestern is unbelievable. First time, I think, in their history, or at least a very long time, that they've gone to back-to-back dances. And if you look at it from you know, a roster build perspective, they're losing a lot of production. So this would be a good time if Chris Collins wanted to leave to go now. So that's who I would – I'd give Chris Collins the first call, if it were me. Yeah, I posted about it, actually, uh, maybe a few days ago. I, You know, I was just sitting there thinking, like, who would be a good fit for Michigan? And I thought – Chris Collins, like he's already at a prestigious uh, academic university and uh, Michigan Mm -hmm. obviously has very good academics. And so he would be able to work with that in the transfer portal. Obviously that's something that has gotten Michigan here lately. They weren't able to add Terrence Shannon Jr. They weren't able to add Caleb Love due to admissions issues. So uh, obviously Chris Collins has experience with trying to be able to figure that out. So um, yeah, uh, Phillips says Collins wants Duke. Um, I feel like he's going to be waiting on that for so Maybe long. Wait a while. Yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> know. This, this, like, at this point, that ship has sailed, at least for the time. Yeah. yeah. Like, I can see Dusty May waiting for Indiana at Florida Atlantic. You know, Mike Woodson's up there in age, and obviously he's not very popular right now after losing Liam uh, you know, McNeely. McNeely. Yeah. Um, what's that character from Taken? I said his name last time. McNeeson. Liam. Yeah, <laughs> I said like, Liam McNeese and they were like, oh, uh, John, don't say him. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, so I, I know he wants Duke. I've heard that as well. But I feel like Chris Collins, like he has to just like 
kind of do his career until Duke just opens up because I don't think they're going to be moving on from John Shire anytime soon unless he's just no. super disappointing. Evan, any thoughts on the Michigan stuff? Um, I'm actually, from an outsider perspective, I've been a little disappointed with the coaching college basketball this year because you had, I mean, you had Ohio State, Michigan, Louisville open up, and I was really hoping for some kind of absolute mayhem of, you know, would Eric Musselman move, would Nate Oates move, would, you know, there was uh, Scott Drew was rumored to, for Louisville, but that, you know, that was squashed today. So I'm kind of just sad that we're not seeing a whole bunch of shakeup like we usually see in college football. Um, yeah, I think Jerome Tang would be a great hire. Um, Dusty May. Uh, I, I'm a little, oh. oh, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Gotcha. Um, I've seen Dusty May's name linked to a lot of different jobs. Um, I think, yeah, Drum yeah. Tank would be good. I mean, Chris Collins could be a good one as well, but I think yeah, he's holding out for something else. But um, I don't uh, – I enjoy watching Michigan kind of flounder around for basketball. They had their fun with football. <laughs> you know who yeah, I, don't, name I, don't that I've... I don't feel Yeah, bad. I don't feel bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the fact that they went from not. like that – how awesome he was to like – just how much, how quickly John Howard crashed and burned that program was pretty astounding. Yeah, that was. Uh, I see a lot of Michigan fans uh, quoting John Howard's tournament success, and I, I just, you know, if Ryan Day had tournament success in uh, football, they wouldn't <laughs> give him any credit, but, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to stay out of it. I'm trying to not be biased. Uh, one last thing. I, I will say I have been um, – surprised that a guy in uh bryce drew from grand canyon old vanderbilt coach he mm -hmm. has not gotten very much love for some of these jobs i would have thought you know bryce drew would be looked at for maybe louisville michigan mm -hmm. uh, i thought ohio state might even look at him but he's not been looked at in fact the crazy thing is is that i heard so uh jake diebler was an assistant for bryce drew when they were at vanderbilt and he was mm -hmm. the primary recruiter similar to how he was the primary recruiter for chris holtman at Ohio State. Well, apparently Bryce Drew is contemplating coming to Ohio State to be an assistant coach after a t what is it like 28 and 4 season or something like that at Grand wow. Canyon? Like crazy to think about, but that's, you know, like I said, who knows how much how much truth there is to that, but that's what I've heard. So, anyway, all right. Uh, good talk, guys. Appreciate you coming on here, talking about the NCAA tournament games. Uh, Blake, we'll have to have you on again. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot of Nebraska podcasts that I pull from. So, uh, you know, if you guys go on a winning streak and you're in the Sweet 16, you're always invited back, man. I'm telling you what, if if we uh, beat Houston on Sunday to go to Sweet 16, they're going to drag me by my feet out of Pearl Street. I mean, I'm like, I <laughs> dude, we're not making it home. I'm telling you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, and Evan, of course, we'll, uh, we'll have you on again at some point. I'm uh, banking on a deep Purdue run. So uh, hoping you know. for it, hoping for it. Sorry. Go ahead. I say Purdue's got a, they have Indy as, as their first two games, hopefully their first two games. So that it'll should be Mackie South. And then they make the second weekend. They've got their, it's a short drive up to Detroit. So it, it, it's worked out nicely. So it's just a matter about just going out and just winning the damn thing. Yep. Got to do that. You want to tell people where they can find boiler breakdown at Evan? Yes, yeah, so all of our socials you can find us at uh, at Boiler Break Pod, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all that fun stuff. Uh, we about one episode a week um, for basketball and football season. Then we'll be doing some stuff in the off season. Whether we do like we'll do like Purdue trivia, we'll try and do player interviews if we can get them, um, and just kind of keeping up with the craziness that is the transfer portal. Very cool, Blake. You want to tell people where they can find Scarlet Shoot Round? Yeah, we're pretty much every single social at Scarlet Shoot Pod on Twitter, where we do a lot of our main stuff. Uh, YouTube, we've kind of slowed down a little bit just because it's a ton of work to, to do all that. Um, and then on uh, uh, obviously on your Apple and Spotify and things like that, at uh, search Scarlet Shooter on podcast. Mm -hmm. This is our first year. Um, it's kind of exploded beyond, especially the Twitter, beyond anything that we could have ever imagined it being. So um, it's obviously, you know, been a product of, of, you know, again, we'll take some credit, but Nebraska has had an amazing magical year. So um, we just kind of capitalized on a lot of positive momentum in the program, but it's been a ton of fun. We post after every single game. We do live reaction videos. We do our own custom edits and things like that. Um, it's, it's a ton of fun. We got our merchandise going out. We just did a giveaway. So we're super active on Twitter. So if you're, uh, you're looking for a good Nebraska basketball follow, I'd like to say that we're one of the best. So, and I got to say this chat tonight has been super nice to Nebraska. So I, I love these guys. <laughs> these guys are great. Well, we've, we've kind of had like two darlings this season on this podcast, and uh, one of them has been Minnesota, and the other one's been Nebraska. They're kind of like been our, uh, you know, I wouldn't say 
pets, but the the, the teams that we have like enjoyed the most. Good like job, right? uh, when I say pets, it's like I'm I'm not really like my team stinks. So Jake Diebler came in and saved us, but like <laughs> so I can't really we've, speak for anything. But we've never won a tournament game. I don't take any offense, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope you get your first tournament. Uh, when, you guys play tomorrow or Friday? We play Friday evening at I think it's five fifty Central is the proposed tip. So should be a good right. one. I, I'm telling you, just look in the arena. There's gonna be a lot of red. All right, good luck, man. Go big red. Go big red. There we go. All right, thanks everybody for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Evan, for coming on here. Have a good night.